the theory basically says that whatever biological genetic foundation underpinnings push uh, that causes schizophrenia is the same biological genetic foundation that creates shamans in traditional societies. I'm Adam Hunt, and this is the Evolving Psychiatry Podcast, rethinking mental health through an evolutionary lens. Share it with the people who matter, like it if you like it, subscribe if you want to hear more. Joseph Polymeni is a psychiatrist working in Canada. Uh, he's an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Manitoba. Joe's got a private clinic. Um, he works as a practicing psychiatrist and conducts medical examinations for uh, major employers. He's been involved in a wide range of research, including in uh, clinical trials, neuroimaging, and uh, most of all, the reason he's here today, uh, most uh, interestingly, hopefully to all of our listeners, is, is his work in evolutionary psychiatry, particularly regarding schizophrenia. I think he's done some really interesting work in this field. So thank you, Joe, for, for coming on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm interested in how you've kind of come into evolutionary psychiatry. There's not that much out there. Or what, what, what kind of drew you to the field? When did you first hear about it? What, what, uh, yeah, what got you? Yeah, I, I, started, uh, I started actually outside of academia as a general psychiatrist, which is now a rare bird because people specialize. And so, you know, that gave me a lot of exposure to different um, conditions across the board. And uh, I just, out of interest, was reading about, you know, anthropological, uh, you know, uh, anthropology and tribes and things like that. And it was quite interesting because I could see the, um, you know, I was looking for the, the similarities between different cultures and things I was seeing in, in my patients. So, uh, you know, I just, I just kept reading. Then I started reading about evolution and evolution's like, um, it's like reading, it's, it's like getting the, uh, it's like getting your car manual after you've been driving your car for a few years, you start to see these patterns and you go, oh, wow, this is part of the operating system. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, all that sort of came together. And then eventually I got back into academia and okay. started writing papers. Okay. And when you were reading these, uh, uh these reports, like these ethnographies, um, do you, do you remember like particular instances of kind of cases that you think, oh, we wouldn't, we would think of this as, uh, you know, a, a mental illness or, or, you know, or, yeah, or like well, different. One, one, one of the first striking ones was Jane Goodall's description of one of the primates that um, was grieving. I think it was a teenage primate that uh, was grieving uh, his mother. And I remember you know, the description was just like clinical depression. And it just, to me, seemed coincidence that, you know, it, it, it started to tell me, well, maybe the seeds of depression, you know, the physiological reactions of depression are, are, are quite old. And of course, then, you know, reading about uh, shamans and religion in, in, uh, in uh, traditional societies, you start to clearly see parallels between uh, that kind of uh, those kind of myths and the kinds of things that your patients are telling you, right, right. So this is where I know your your work from the most. This is what I, uh, I mean, your 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 longest and most um, impressive work in evolutionary psychiatry has been your book uh, Shamans Among Us, uh, and it's really um, a phenomenal uh, effort to bring together huge amounts of evidence, both from yes the the, the kind of anthropological research, but also kind of looking at the evolutionary models and the, the 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 hallmarks of schizophrenia um so so yeah i think it would just be really good if we could uh kind of go over the basics of uh what what your hypothesis is here or what you lay out in the book um you know uh, assume people don't really know what schizophrenia looks like or what shamanism looks like uh you know like yeah take us on that that journey right but i like to preface uh this by uh, um suggesting that okay well the first First is that the theory basically says that whatever biological genetic foundation underpinnings push uh, that causes schizophrenia is the same biological genetic foundation that creates shamans in traditional societies. And 
And and because we're dealing with two different cultures, we see two different entities. So the first thing, you know, uh, uh, the the first thing I'd like to mention it's a little bit like saying, you know, a a, bur- a a hamburger, you know, in the United States is the same thing as sushi in Japan. Um, it's like I'm saying that it's all food, and and others who perhaps may disagree with the theory say, well, no, this is that, that's sushi and that's a burger. They're not the same thing. And I'm saying, well, they sort of are. You know, uh, so the, only cult- yeah. So the phenotype only culture, has, only culture has shaped them. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the phenotype manifests differently, uh, yes. or the, we interpret it differently, and the way that yeah these these intuitions, um, these kind of instincts manifest uh, would be different between different cultures, which we kind of already do know they are. Um, and so your yeah the core of your hypothesis is yes, in one the same person who's becoming schizophrenic here if they were living in a tribe, would have become a shaman or entered the shaman role. Right. Um, and and one, one really conspicuous issue is, is that, you know, if you look cross-culturally where there's shamans, you don't generally see schizophrenia. And where there's schizophrenia, you don't generally see uh, shamans. Um, I mean, societies now are becoming much more, uh, you know, complicated. And so now there's room for both. But in general, before, you know, especially before the, 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 the you know, the Renaissance uh, and, you know, even very recently. Um, the other thing is that one has to understand that shaman is a, is, is a, is a sort of like an occupational position. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a societal role. While schizophrenia really focuses on the, the, the found, the, the foundational biological um, uh, phenotype. So in other words, it's a, a little bit like comparing tall people with basketball players. So, you know, schizophrenia is like saying, well, this person's tall, while being a shaman uh, says, no, the, this person is a basketball player. Um, so again, they're sort of two different things, but you can see how they're related. I mean, you know, if you're tall in in Western society, it's one of the first things they, you know, your your parents may say, "Oh, go play basketball. You'll probably be successful in that." Right. I, I had a story of a, a Turkish friend who had a, a a female friend who was six foot eight in, in at the age of fifteen, and she became a basketball player because, like, what else? What else do you do as a very, especially as a as a female? That's a that's a huge advantage. Um, okay, this is. Right, so so just to kind of like uh, rewind a bit, I think there's something uh, really, really kind of ancient. Well, okay, maybe not, maybe not ancient, but there's something at least a hundred years old um, that that is noticing that schizophrenia is heritable, and these tendencies towards um, developing psychotic states is somewhat heritable. It runs in families. Um, and there's this there's this paradox which I which was what is one of the main reasons I came into evolutionary psychiatry was thinking about this paradox and how we solve it. Uh, this paradox that was named the schizophrenia paradox um, by I think it was Julian Huxley. Uh, and yeah, the the question is why do so many people, especially you know around one percent of individuals um, in, in most of the cultures we've kind of looked at, why do they develop this heritable phenotype that should have been selected out if it's bad? It should have been removed from the population. Um, there has to be some explanation, like why why this tendency persists in the human in the human psyche, uh, as you say. Uh, and so your your kind of your proposition is that uh, the reason it's so common and the reason that it keeps on manifesting everywhere in across these cultures is because it has this religious kind of place, right? Um, so could you talk a little bit about the? Yeah. Yeah, I mean the symptoms of like symptoms of schizophrenia and the kind of uh, the, the cognition of, of shamanism and and what yeah. what you think is most startling here. Well, okay, so 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 shamans, uh, you, if you if you look at and and and, and there's uh, so shamans, which is another term for shamans, is magical religious practitioner, which is probably a little more accurate, but not really used a lot. But but it yeah. does emphasize the fact that most traditional societies have religions that really have a lot of magic. And a lot of uh, and 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 you know anybody who's read about traditional societies know that you know they have things like uh, they fuse animals and people or they fuse c- those concepts all the time in their mythology. Um, mm-hmm. That uh, you know they have uh, they talk a lot about curses. They talk a lot about yeah. 
superstition, ghosts, yeah. you know, stones that can give you bad luck, things like that. I mean, that, and, and and it's just replete with these kind of things. Um, uh, that's so. That's what one thing that has to be understood. Uh, second, what does a shaman do? Well, a lot of the what a shaman tends to do in in almost every traditional society is uh, heal heal the sick. Um, they predict, uh, you know, climb uh, changes in climate, like rain dances, things like that. Uh, they uh, are often asked to prognosticate about war, um, and they're often involved in rituals of, um, you know, birth and death and you know, coming of age and, and and marriage, things like that. Okay, so that's sort of the generally what shamans do in most traditional cultures. Um, the now, now, the problem with this is that not everything that a shaman does is evolutionarily advantageous. Um, you know, like, but because once you, you once you program, let's say, for lack of a better word, somebody with these uh, this, these tendencies, uh, you know, some of the some of it could be uh, evolutionarily advantageous, but some of it could be incidental. I, I personally believe a lot of shamans' activities just happen to be that once you pro, you know, once you have that predisposition, you have a natural tendency to do something, you know, something X, uh, but that's not really helping your your really in any deep way the, 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 the tribe. I think some things are probably very uh, powerful. Uh, paranoid thinking, I think, is very powerful because I think humans tend to let their guard down, and to have to have one of your members like always going, you know, those guys over there over the hill, nah, I don't know about them. Um, that's very powerful to 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 protect uh, your tribe. Um, the 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 other things we forget that that in traditional societies, there's some evidence that up to between 10 and 30 percent of people throughout history have been killed in violence. It's something we don't think about. So, so think about anything that protects you from that is powerful, could have really powerful evolutionary uh, effects. Um, so now, this, let's, sorry. There's this, there's this element of um, religiosity helping people come together, right? There's, um, there's, there's, there's a lot of work on why religion evolved uh, and, and yeah, one of the one of the, the kind of classic hypotheses of, of uh, looking at cooperation essentially and like it, it yeah. especially for hunting as well like and and also for defending yourself or going on raids one thing that humans really need to do is just kind of band together in whatever they're going to do and and having a religious um practitioner to say yes i've um i've i've heard a message from the gods or i've i've burnt the stone and it's cracked and i'm i'm, I'm kind of um yeah, I'm, I'm sort of uh, prophesying that the best way to go hunting is in that direction. Uh, that's just very that's just very effective for humans to kind of cooperate, right? Um, right, and, and I mean, and and uh, so 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 here's some interesting ideas. I mean, one is that okay, so so there's a debate about whether evolution, uh, sorry, religion is evolutionarily advantageous. I think uh, you know, and, and I think a lot of people have talked about this. I mean, I like to use John Price's uh, sort of formulation where he, I mean, everything's sort of a, a simple, uh, oversimplification, but he 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 put it down to three things that religion does clearly: divination, um, it increases morale, and it uh, helps morality. And and I, I mean, we can divide these things into different things, but yeah, I think most people who who see the role of religion in, in traditional societies can can see those effects. Uh, we can debate about how powerful they are. Um, uh, but there's a lot of uh, there's it, what's interesting is that you know uh, a, a, a lot of traditional uh, religion is about some sort of spirit watching over you to do the right thing, and that's a sort of repeated pattern. Um, so uh, the other thing about that John Price made sort of very clear, um, uh, and, and I think couple of us had hinted at it, but he, he was very explicit, um, is that religion has to come out of, out of the, uh, has to come out of the brain of one person, uh, because you're no farther ahead if you have a democratic debate about some of these matters, that, that things that are logical, things that are logical, we all will debate them and we'll, we'll have a rational conversation, but there are points where there just isn't a rational, um, uh, solution. And so you have to you have to do an uh, you have to follow an arbitrary decision and 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 a lot of a lot of shamans do those kind of things so you know water witching for example well you know if you have no idea where you're going to look for water it, you know and you need to get eight feet deep let's say um, if everybody yeah. goes and just digs two feet deep. 
No, so you have the shaman and he says with great certainty, this mm -hmm. is where the water is. Because remember, mm -hmm. you know, patients with patients with schizophrenia are often so convinced of arbitrary matters. Mm -hmm. And so uh and and so, you know, the, the the tribe can rally around the shaman. Now, if the if the tribe sees that the, the, that there's some dampness in some sort of area, they're not going to talk to the shaman. They're just going to yeah. dig there. Everybody's going to agree. So that's not. So shamans usually come in to making decisions when they don't know even nobody knows what to do. Hmm. And it's like an ordained, uh, yeah, it's an ordained position. Okay, well, I'm, we'll just we'll just follow this this sort of arbitrary um, the digging spot or whatever. Okay, yeah. So. Uh, so one of the things that you talk about uh, most in the book is the the kind of the symptoms of schizophrenia, like the delusions, the hallucinations, um, the fact that you have this uh, this age of onset, which sort of aligns very well with like the shamanic um, sort of awakening, as it's called. Yeah, yeah, the uh, initiation. Yeah, the initiation. Right, exactly. Um, and I think that's a very yeah, that's a that's a really interesting um, and quite convincing um, aspect of the, of the of the argument is that you know in many cultures around the world you see whatever 15 to 25 year olds entering these sort of insane states um and indeed in in a lot of um a lot of shamanistic uh, initiations like there's there's a time when they're thought of as sick you know they have this period of being overcome with the spirits or eaten by the spirits i think some of the translations are um and then the question is whether or not they can kind of conquer them and master them or not uh, and often there are you know there are pathways where the person can kind of have this experience perhaps it's psychosis um and then if they kind of come out of that and they're they're more controlled and they can kind of become a normal member of society then they become a a shaman um but if not then you know assume they, they get exiled or killed or whatever um, yeah, so I think that's uh, really interesting and um, quite, yeah, it, it's it's, uh, it's it's sort of counterintuitive, but you can kind of see it, right? Yeah. Well, I, I, w I would say that that I think that, you know, we, we, we live in, in a world of sound bites. We can't be expert in everything. And so I think a lot of people, I think, believe that psychiatric conditions are more static than they are. Um, mm. I mean, you know, post-traumatic stress disorders often, you know, if you ask most people, they say, well, it's like something you have all the time. Well, it's really, a, it's a, it's more of a state of mind. You're vulnerable to it. But, you know, a lot of my post-traumatic stress uh, disorder patients uh, are not bothered by, you know, their, their, uh, their vulnerability to PTSD, the nightmares for sometimes years at a time. Um, mm. You know, it's the same thing with psychosis. I mean, yes, there are intractable cases and those are very well known because they stay in hospital a long time and you know sometimes they defy modern treatments but um but uh there's i mean in, in both you know both now you can see in the natural world uh, in our world and also historically uh psychosis so uh, often came and went and uh, and sometimes it's simmered underneath and um so you know we we often have this vision or this idea that it's more static than it is right and i mean so this is something that I would maybe say about the the shamanism schizophrenia hypothesis uh, in general is um, you concentrate on schizophrenia, uh, but there's a whole kind of range of psychotic experiences, and and also bipolar disorder is like you know has high genetic correlations with schizophrenia, which implies that there's some if there is an evolutionary reason for the the bipolar forward slash schizophrenic genes um, to kind of exist in the in the population um, then maybe it's linked so yeah i wonder what you think about that and about you know something is it like five to ten percent of people will experience like an episode of psychosis at some point in their life if you include kind of stress related yeah. and then i mean obviously drugs kind of push things up and, and, and yeah, maybe yeah, there wouldn't yeah. be as many um drugs but yeah so that's so that's an interesting um kind of angle is like it's not just one percent it's like a lot of people and then and then even in the subclinical range you know you have this whole uh, like almost the majority of the population have supernatural instincts, you might say. You know, they're superstitious. They believe that the stars are controlling us, or that if they do these little rituals, then it's somehow um, helping them. Well, I would, I would, I, I would argue that we're all superstitious. Uh, to, yeah. to you know, um, and 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 and, and, and the, the thought experiment that I often use is, uh, you know, um, um, even just just verbally say, to, you know, think of a person who you love. And say um, something. They're going to die tomorrow, you know. Uh, just as a, you know, even as a joke. Like, um, like, oh, her uncle was dead. 
It is uncomfortable, isn't it? Yeah, it's weirdly and, uncomfortable. And it's a bit of a thought experiment because, well, why do I, I mean, from a scientific perspective, I mean, it's ridiculous to, to feel uncomfortable. Right. But, but I do. I'm sorry? Draw a picture of, draw a picture of them and just start putting pins in it. Yeah, sure. It shouldn't, it shouldn't matter at all. But, yeah. Uh, but, there's something but, but, burning. But, but, yeah. Well, we feel, we feel on the discomfort with that. And I would, I, you know, I am probably, I think, you know, very much in ensconced in science. My father was a scientist, so I've been I've been you know uh, thinking about you know the uh, rational thought since I was uh, you know five years old, and and yet I feel uncomfortable with saying something like that, which I think is a thought experiment, which shows I do have a little bit of superstition and a little bit of really religiosity in me, which means I do have this emotional sense. That maybe there is something greater out there. There's a greater connection that can't be explained by science. Um, mm -hmm. Now I, I can override that, and I and 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 I have with students, you know, said some things that you know, but I, I don't want to push my luck anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it's a really it's a weird um, dance we have to do in this sort of science believing world, right? Where we're we're forced to say yes, no. There's no supernatural forces and but i think i when, I, when you talk to a lot of scientists privately some of them are actually very superstitious in some ways and then they think that the experiments they choose they chose because they had a dream about it or yeah. um or whatever or like the wind was blowing in a particular way and it slammed a door shut on them or yeah. there's all these sort of um there's all these sort of interesting tendencies which are in the human psyche which um yeah, it's, well, it's, it's, it's so tough hard. To, it's, tough, it's, it's, it's tough to tease out our emotions. And then I always you know, call that sort of a gut instinct. Sometimes you don't trust somebody and you have no rational reason to trust them. But maybe you are picking up some unconscious cues mm. that you don't even realize. And so you you have to, I think you do have to be aware of that. Now, for me, that's not a defense of, of, of religion or, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a very firm atheist. But I do believe I have the emotions that can push me to religiosity. Um, right. And so, uh, you know, so, so there's, so, yeah, this is deep in human nature. I mean, everyone probably will admit that, that religiosity is somehow deeply natural. Mm -hmm. It's, there's something evolutionary going on there where, where yeah. it's, it sort of arises everywhere. Um, societies are kind of built around it. People have these tendencies. Um, and then, so the, the, the schizophrenic, you're, you're, or should we, yeah, go on. Sorry. I was just going to say, you know, it's interesting. There's, there's, there's four areas that are in the intersect of psychosis and um, rel religion. And depending on which paradigm you come from, uh, you know, and those are paranormal, uh, the, the idea of paranormal phenomenon, uh, spirit possession, um, the, the experiences of hallucinogens, and, uh, uh, and, cu and cults. Um, uh -huh. The, the 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 proper name is new religious movements, but most people know them as uh, as cults. Um, yeah, and and those four things, depending on your perspective, you either say that's the fringe of religion, or you say that's the fringe of psychosis. Okay, and yeah. uh, very easy that. And my argument is that they're really they're fringe of both. Okay, because because so, psychosis and religion are interconnected. I, again, right. it's not to say that somebody's religious or psychotic. That's not what I'm saying. Yes, <laughs> yes. Christianity is one big delusion. Yeah, no, that's a very, very popular uh, belief. I can't, I can't remember. I think I talked about this um, hypothesis to someone. Uh, it was at some kind of lecture, and I asked a question, um, and and then so yeah, someone in the audience came up to me afterwards and said, "Oh, so Dawkins, uh, the God Delusion book was actually more more." Um, technically accurate than than uh, than he might have thought um which i thought was quite a nice um yeah i you know I, I, when i discussed this with you know and i do have lots of friends who are deeply religious and you know and how do i square this circle basically you know and and these friends are very intellectual very deep thinkers um the way I square the circle, I, I, I have to, uh, but I have to, you know, if I'm really being honest, I have to say, I think you have an emotion inside of you that you're not really recognizing that's sort of pushing you to favor one hypothesis over another. And, you know, and nobody wants to hear that they have an emotion that they're not recognizing. So, um, but I, I, I don't think that's, I, I don't think that's a, you know, a, a crazy idea because I, as a psychiatrist, I've discovered emotions in myself 
years later. And I realized there's so many more. I I can trace back, you know, because I you know because I I'm sitting in an office thinking about motivations and and you know unconscious things all day long. I have that great luxury of doing that for 35 years, and 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 you know and 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 every psychiatrist is their own patient uh, because you're mm-hmm. constantly to you about yourself and your life and you know and I you know I recognize boy you know I made this decision two years ago yeah you know that was because you know one 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 concept is narcissism for example the idea of you know putting yourself in the center of the universe which I think a lot of us have that emotional um drive we all do um uh, no, no. but we, we we but we don't feel it you know um uh, but but that engine is pushing us there, and we see it indirectly by you know how many times I say the word I in, in a paragraph, um, mm-hmm. or you know am I am I talking about what I'm interested rather than what you're interested? Um, now a lot of us can hide it because we can sort of you know we could see ourselves as a third party and we can you know we can but but you know it doesn't 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 um, uh, take away that these these very difficult to understand forces uh, exist in our heads. Right, and we might, well, we firstly might not be aware of them, but we also aren't really aware of the culture which they arose within over hundreds of thousands of years, um, potentially, uh, which I think, so So the schizophrenia shamanism hypothesis is, I think, one of like the most interesting hypotheses, but it's also one of the most controversial in evolutionary psychiatry, just because schizophrenia is like the textbook bad disorder. It's like the worst of the worst, you have like the worst outcomes, of yeah. pretty much anything you'd rather have you know any sort of uh physical condition or probably almost any other mental health condition apart from schizophrenia if you wanted to get out you know and and when i've talked to psychiatrists about the this then they are it, it is the one that they, they seem to struggle with um perhaps because they see the most uh disabled individuals um uh, but yeah i mean yeah so i'm interested how you how you think about that how you how you like yeah square this kind of controversial aspect and what you would say to your kind of colleagues um, I would who, say that uh, I don't. I I don't see it any. I, I don't see it any different than they do on a clinical basis. I believe that. I believe that even though it's a phenotype, it causes tremendous suffering. I think it causes suffering even in traditional societies. I think that some of that suffering is mitigated. Um, you know, I think you and I know that evolution doesn't care whether you suffer or not, just that your genes get passed on. I think that's a that's an idea that a lot of people I don't think have in their back back of their mind, um, mm-hmm. and uh, so suffering. Unfortunately, uh, we're always just two seconds away from suffering because you know evolution has to re- constantly remind us to, to 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 keep you know to keep our bodies integrated, um, and so uh, you know I, I, I it is never it is never really deeply or I. I don't think it's really affected my, my treatment of patients. Um, I, I've said I said in my book that no matter what this thing is, um, my patients don't want it for the most part mm-hmm. when they have inst- to when they can make the connection uh, because often schizophrenia, the, the disorder of thinking, you know, uh, erodes your insight. But so you know, it's um, I I don't disagree uh, with that. It's it, it has tremendous suffering. Uh, that it uh, is it, that it causes a lot of irrationality, um, uh, potentially not you know, not always. Um, you know. The other um, yeah, the other uh, interesting thing about the the kind of phenotype of schizophrenia, um, which I've had some kind of discussions about with uh, with people, is that the the, there's this there's this very nice clean example of the the schizophrenic who believes they are Jesus or believes they're a, a prophet or that they're hearing spirits or whatever um but that's not every that's not every schizophrenic um yeah. so like so yeah so what's so what's happening in those cases when they're kind of instead the delusions are about the the CIA or yeah. you know okay. people hiding nanobots in your body or whatever yeah so so yeah right. how, how do you think the hypothesis deals with that okay so so basically I've hitched uh, my card to Pascal Boyer's theory of his ex- his explanation of the cognitive structure of religion. Now, this is hypothetical, uh, but to me, um, having worked with it for 10, 15 years, I ha- don't see a lot of contrary examples. So, what does what does what is Boyer's um, explanation of the cognitive structure of religion? What is that? Um, that is uh, his perspective is that um, 
we see the world in five ontological categories that somehow we are, the humans are programmed to see the world sort of as five categories rather than sort of seeing them as spectrum. And what are those categories? That's human, plant, animal, man-made object, and natural object. And so even though you can have blends of these things, um, we don't accept the blends that easily because we tend to want to see them as five separate categories. And so what a religious thought is, is when um, one of those categories is violated and or you blend those categories. So example, um, I mean, almost take, it, it, take almost any religious uh, idea and it it tends it fits so uh, you know in traditional societies a volcano that uh, eats people well that's an that's a natural object natural objects don't eat okay um, mm-hmm. uh, that's a violation as uh, uh, Haitian zombies and uh, there's zombies in other cultures too well that's a person who's alive but is dead being dead is a violation of being human um, you know so so you know uh, so much tr- uh, so much shaman uh, um, uh, themes. Are blending animals with you know uh, with humans, animals that talk. Um, that's that's a violation of what are, you know. And animals don't talk. I mean, again, um, this this is just sort of these g- general uh, ideas. Um, it's interesting that something really weird doesn't usually become a religious uh, idea. Uh, I can think of you know lots of weird ideas like you know like, in my book I think I write. Uh, like uh, somebody who has, uh, you know, a, a, a forty. Uh, yes, going, you know, traveling upside down. That that's not that's that's not going to it doesn't violate one of the ontological categories. So it's probably not going to be a candidate for a religious idea. So, mm. so then when you look at schizophrenia, and this we when we did this study twice, we've taken about thirty patients, and when you when you broaden the definition of religion. Well, then you see that almost every all psychosis really fits under there. So um, now, what's interesting is about sixty percent of of, of uh, religious, uh, sorry, of, of uh, psychotic themes are actually just outright religious. I am the devil. Uh, I saw Jesus. I, you know, Mother Mary to me. Uh, all of that kind of stuff. But the other forty percent is things that I believe are religious uh, structured, but we don't see them as such. So. Um, somebody, uh, I, I was just reading yesterday uh, in, in my own book, uh, the, the, one of the patients was saying that uh, somebody can change my teeth. Hmm. It, you know, it sounds like a pretty innocuous thing to say, but think about that. That is action at a distance. That is not, that is a religious idea because um, I can't change your teeth from here. That's magic. You know, that's the stuff of magic. Uh, that's the stuff of curses. Um and uh, and so uh, that's a religious thought. Now, what 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 ontological category can do action at a distance? It's nature, natural objects. That's the only one. So the tides, gravity, all of that, wind. Um, so yeah. I think you know. I, I think when you start, you know, if you, and so like you know, if you want to play name that delusion, um, I, you know, whatever delusion I, you you see, I can usually. Um, you know, explain that you no, know, this is this is a violation of an onto- ontological category. Interesting. And so the, you, I think you mention this in your in your book as well. Or maybe I've just read this in in another paper. I'm sorry, it's, yeah. it's all a blur of uh, research. There's this um, there's this nice example from South Africa, I believe it was, where you have three different um, essentially three different uh, ethnicity groups um, who were presenting with. Schizophrenia, um, but their delusional, their, the specifics of their delusions were quite different. Um, I think it was like the white Christians um, heard the voice of Jesus, uh, and then uh, another group who were more connected with their kind of ancestral history were hearing the, the voices of their uh, their ancestors. Um, yeah. And so the, the, the kind of structure of the delusion works within their kind of local cultural context. I would, right? say, the, um, I would say the content does, not the structure. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Right. So there's the structure is the same, and then the content sort of fills in. So yeah. you're kind of filling in what's the what's the powerful supernatural thing around me, and maybe to some people that's the CIA. They have this 
giant organization that's everywhere and that has all this power and has incredible technology or whatever. And then to, to other people, it's um, the church and, and Christianity and God, uh, and and that's just because of their that I'll bring it. Okay, so so that's um, right. and it was interesting when when we we when I went into charts from around the turn of the century, about a hundred years ago, uh, and started looking um, at the uh, at the entries. What was really interesting was electricity was often a source of delusions. You know mm-hmm. that the, the the power of of electricity. Right. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I remember you saying, and radio waves, right? And like, yeah. Yeah, right. because all that stuff, all that stuff was new and was in there uh, and was this new match, uh, this quasi magical idea. Now, I mean, mm. now you don't, now, you know, our, 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 our patients tend to glom onto the newer, you know, nanobots. Magic. Yeah. 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 Nanobots. Yeah. Satellites. Um, exactly. Yeah. Video. I mean, cameras. It used to, um, exactly. It used to be um, the televisions watching me. Now that, that's a that was so common that the, the you know instead of you watching a TV which they were you know they're doing but many patients with schizophrenia were experiencing that the television that the newscasters you know or the people on TV were were signaling to them personally. So what happens if you're you're a hunter gatherer you're living in a a forest and you start having these same the same structure of beliefs right you're you're kind of looking around maybe you you feel like the trees are watching you you associated with like some kind of jungle spirit or an animal spirit that's watching you and sending you messages or something like that. So yeah, I see. Yeah. Well, yeah that's I mean, a, it's a, I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. the vigilance of I mean, the paranoid thinking is also very, very common. And I mean, and these are, these are non, these are great questions. I mean, you know, why is, why are 30% of, of delusions paranoid, you know, uh, you know, and does that change from culture to culture? I mean, we, we don't know the answer to this. I mean, uh, mm-hmm. You know, um, uh, you know how much is related to divina- d- divination. You know, um, it, it, these are you know. Uh, I mean, look, no one's going to pretend that they understand, you know, the exact content and 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 type of you know uh, uh, delusion that anybody can come up with. It's 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 a black box. But you know, we're starting to glean some general patterns. I you know I. Yeah, I, I don't have firsthand knowledge of traditional societies, uh, you know, other than you know having read a lot about you know these, these examples, how they develop. You know, I, I don't know. Mm. I mean, it's actually something that we're sort of looking into um, with a group of anthropologists I'm, I'm kind of working with, yeah. or at least it it would be good to go. Like there, are, I think there are a lot of anthropologists question. interested in this, and and I mean also just cross culturally. You know what. what in a in rural India in a village in India, you know what what are the delusions kind of manifest like? Is it the same structure? Uh, how are they integrated? Um, I think you have some interesting examples of people who seem to kind of um, or present with psychosis and then are discharged eventually, and then do actually go into some sort of uh, religious healing um, role. Um, I think there was a recent paper from Japan where that was they they also found that. Um, yeah, it's 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 interesting the. It, it it still hits this uh this very sort of deep uh, and perhaps like instinctual um reaction I think from people in the West who've seen someone go through psychosis and they're just so out of control and this is one of the classic uh, one of the classic um, criticisms that I, I hear is like the shamanism is like the, the shaman is sort of is like a master of control they have you know like so much social nuance and they're they're very um. You know, they're able to remember all these songs and things, and then and then people think about that in comparison to the the kind of psychotic person who's you know, especially in well, first in an extreme period of psychosis, and they're completely out of control, and you can't make sense to them. And, and the idea that they could sit down and conduct these like healing rituals um, seems very alien. But I I, I wonder how you'd yeah you know, go on. Please. Yeah, I think it's been overly categorical. I mean, you know, um, I I I think that look. Um, we know that nature is not perfect, um, you know. So, so for example, I mean, there's. I mean, I'm not suggesting that the extremes of psychosis in a traditional society would be a, a shaman. I mean, you know, and it's 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 most likely the the, the milder cases, um, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it, so that that's one thing. Um, I, yeah. I think often I think we often underestimate how um, intellectual and in control our patients are. 
Um, you know, I think that, you know, we have these sort of images of somebody being, you know, uh, in a straight jacket on a ward. Well, th- those are really very few and very, and, and also just a, a, a very a, a small period of time. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, anybody who treats uh, schizophrenia, the bulk of their day is talking to very thoughtful people, often a little, in some ways, maybe a little more intellectual because they you know, have all these ideas that come into their minds and, and relationships um, and, uh, you know, uh, and, and so, you know, I, having that experience of having so many intellectual conversations with, with, with my patients, uh, you know, in remission, um, I mean, gives me a bit of a different such, you know, uh, perspective. I mean, no doubt I've also done inpatient psychiatry where you're dealing with people who are very, very sick. Uh, but it's, you know, um, we forget often that's not a big part of that 1%. Um, right. And again, and, and no one, no one would suggest that. Again, like I said, it, that shaman is an occupational, is is a societal role, and 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 you know, not everybody at the extremes of psychosis would. I mean, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to denigrate yeah. the societal role of a shaman. Uh, there has to be some level of integrity. But I think, I think you know, we, we no one, no one's ever suggesting that the worst of psychosis uh, is a shaman. Uh, that's not, you know. But I do believe yeah. that if somebody is, but I do believe if somebody has these delusions, I do think it, it puts a lot of religious ideas front and center too. So it, it could have some positive influence by having that. So again, nature is hard. How nature um, expresses, you know, phenotypic advantage is, is messy. We know that. Mm-hmm. And it's yeah. not perfect. Uh, and, and there are times that the extremes are not phenotypically you know, advantageous, right? I mean, in the belt curve. So, so yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's the way I see it. Yeah, I think that that aligns with a lot of the, the kind of evolutionary models I'm sort of working on my um, my PhD because we're looking at yeah how individual differences evolve and and basically you have to recognize that the the thing that evolution uh, selection acts upon is the kind of the total phenotypic effect of the genes which are shared across the population in all sorts of degrees. So you have this spectrum and it's including both bipolar and schizophrenic people and also schizotypal people and everyone on the psychosis spectrum and there are genes kind of pushing them to these experiences and it's plausible that you know that they're interpreted in this religious way and then that's somehow that's for some that's why the function that's what the function of those genes would be um but you don't need to explain that 0.5 percent or even 0.1 percent of schizophrenics who can't uh who can't function and who and you know that can just be a cost right that can just be a yeah. That's that's just you know bad luck and a, a, a collection of the same genes in the person who's already maybe got some other vulnerability because they were you know they had a terrible upbringing or whatever, um, and so the evolutionary model doesn't. We're not trying to explain the whole every every instance of psychosis yeah. or every schizophrenic. Well, it's like attention deficit disorder, which you know I think is pretty clear to is that this is a phenotype that uh, doesn't interface well with a lot of Western. Uh, you know, constraints, uh, you know, going to school for, for six hours. I mean, which is a bizarre thing that we do, yeah. um, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, and I, I do believe just knowing how, how phenotype works, that the extreme of ADD probably was not beneficial, even in traditional societies, you know, mm. but now you put yourself into a Western uh, society in the year 2023 well, that goes from like just a few percent to about well, ten to fifteen or whatever you know is the is the, mm. the numbers of, of, of mostly kids, but even adults now uh, right. having difficulties with this behavioral and cognitive propensity or predisposition, uh, which often does not, you know, it has both benefits and disadvantages. Uh, you know, I I have a touch of ADD and. Uh, you know, I have a little subclinical and, you know, I think it's helped me with my creativity. I don't often have a lot of ideas. Uh, it's also, I don't produce a lot of papers because I just get, I mean, if, if, not, if I'm not writing about something that's, you know, I think is, is really exciting or shattering, I, I am not going to write it, um, is, which was not good for my career if I had to, you know, reflect on it. So, you know, you take the good with the bad. Right. Yeah. Interesting. It's, there's, there's also this connotation. Say we accept the psychosis, um, schizophrenia, uh, or religiosity uh, link. It's it's sort of weird to think about ethically, and maybe this will kind of 
come on to the, this this last question that I want to talk about in terms of like treatment and what we do. Because um, I think with ADD, you can kind of talk about creativity and, you know, there's there's, there's positive aspects to be found. Um, yeah. but there's sort of something interesting about the, the shamanism uh, hypothesis where it's like, we don't have this religious context anymore. We don't, we don't have shamans anymore. We don't, people don't believe that you're going to be listening to spirits. As we talked about, you know, at the very start of a conversation about this kind of superstitious religion, uh, this, this instinct that we have that we, we don't, we kind of suppress with our scientific rationality. So what do we do with this 5% of people who have psychotic episodes? Do we, do we say, oh, this is, this has this relationship to, you know, um, prehistorical religiosity but sorry you've got no place here i mean i don't know yeah it's just it's sort of interesting to think about okay so that that, now we go from a scientific opinion to a political opinion and the Mm -hmm. political opinion is is you know how much do i believe that society has to bend over back the majority has to bend over backwards for the minority uh and you know um and that i think becomes more into a political i mean um uh discussion uh you know i think I think the answer is modifying the minority to 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 sort of integrate with the majority uh, to some degree uh, in in the most empathic you know way that you know you can you, that can be done, um, but also to accept the minority too. So again, how this is done, you know, in, in real in real ways uh, is difficult. So for example, uh, you know. Uh, it, it is it is hard if you if you own a company it is hard to integrate a certain, certain patients with schizophrenia because of the, right. the way their minds work okay um it doesn't now it doesn't mean that they can't be productive but it means you have to do a lot of of of, of, of manipulating your structure to to uh, adapt to to them uh so you know uh, these are open questions uh i i'm i tend to be a believer that we really should try a lot harder to integrate um, not only patients with schizophrenia, but we should work a lot harder to integrate people with ADD, people with autistic traits, um, people with bipolar disorder, people, you know, and even, you know, some some of the extremes of even behavior. Uh, I think right now, um, right now we're living in a world where there's, you know, a, I think a little bit too much constraints at the workplace. Uh, I do, one of my areas is patient psychiatry, and um, I think that we could do a better job as a society to integrate more people into the workplace because I believe that, you know, I have a very, very strong feeling or belief that almost everybody wants to work. Um, Mm -hmm. And often people who say they don't want to work just feel that they've been told, you know, go away implicitly. Um, And so they, so they say, go, you go away. Um, I don't like you. Uh, But I think, I think fundamentally, you know, if given a chance, I think most people want to work. Uh, The people often you know, can't or say they don't want to uh, is because they're really having difficulty integrating it, usually through no fault of their own. Right. Yeah. I mean, maybe working from home and just having more flexible time schedules or, yeah, then people talk about this a lot also with, with autism and, you know, being able to accept that some people prefer emails or um, one noise cancelling headphones, uh, yeah, and just kind of yeah, creating space. I think a lot of a lot of people succeed actually. Well, I, you know, uh, in the old days, a lot, uh, 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 I mean, you think about when did schizophrenia become a problem? In the it, it became a problem with uh, uh, completely aligned with industrialization, hmm. and and in fact, I you know I, I remember seeing a, a case uh, when I was reading a case from. Uh, a man who uh, from about the early 1900s and here in Manitoba and this is there's a, a large farming community and the person was hearing voices and wasn't super productive it seemed uh, but basically after they were hospitalized and there was no treatment they just basically you know were just sort of holding them and until the the psychosis remitted i mean there were some treatments but they really weren't super effective back in the 1920s and basically the the the, the physician wrote well he can go back to being a farmhand you know um, mm-hmm. There's no problem. Now that I remember that case because I I thought this guy would not have a job. I mean, because he would, like the way that the physician wrote it was like he could barely do the farmhand job where he you know there's no scheduling and he just you know any labor he does is 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 a help to the family. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, so so I think industrialization really with 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 this unfailing sort of idea that you have to be somewhere on time. That's a really 
being on time, I mean, for for most of us is pretty simple. But you know, if you have schizophrenia, your your personality just doesn't align well with being on time uh, because you have sort of different sort of way that you process information. So so I mean, it, it's almost all of the traits of schizophrenia did not seem to align with the new jobs um, that industrialization um, pre- presented. Right. And just like employment contracts, being employed on 20 hours a week or 30 hours or 40 hours a week or whatever. And that might be fine for a few months or years. And then if you have an episode of psychosis, you might just have to, you know, be absent for a, a certain yeah. amount of time. And then the, and and we don't and have a good... intolerant to that. I mean, yeah. just think about how much people are worried about a blemish. I mean, you know, you know, you talk to your friends and if they're off work for like a few months... They just go. Yeah. I don't know what. You know, how am I going to apply to another job? Because they're going to think like, why? Why have I not been working for a few months? I mean, people are so worried about like minor blemishes mm-hmm. in in their resumes. You know, you imagine when when you have you know uh, you know have to contend with uh, g- greater problems. Right. I mean, so this is maybe one of the hopes of the the, the hypothesis and also evolutionary psychiatry more generally is um, you know if people are less afraid of schizophrenia because i think it is again it is like it is the, the worst it's the one where yeah. people are completely out of control they're crazy we gotta you know watch out you don't want to live near them you don't want to marry them to them or whatever um yeah. and it yeah and i think there's something that, that is so um yeah interesting about your hypothesis is it really does flip that perspective and make you hopefully more tolerant um and maybe maybe it would kind of increase the social will to to accommodate well, rather than sure so, so I, I I do believe in a, in 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 a you know in a, in a if you're living in a society there is some responsibility you know to um, uh, not be dangerous to your fellow. Uh, now, I mean we we know that the vast majority of patients who have psychosis are not violent, and you know that that's the, you know if what's really interesting here in Manitoba. Um, uh, you know, because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I basically know all the major players uh, in, in, in uh, who run who run the me- mental health in our in our province. Um, what's really interesting is that most of the constraints of of um, uh, of, of the mental health le- legislation comes from families who mm-hmm. feel that it doesn't go uh, uh, doesn't go enough. Uh, you right. Know, uh, so uh, you know, it's not it's not. It's not from sort of other groups. It's family members who are going. Look, my you know my son is just really yeah. doing irrational things, and and your legislation, you know, says that he can still go home. I, I, I just can't you know fathom that. And and you know there have been some slight tweaking of of that because uh, some of these are very you know you, you just feel so 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 you know it's so you feel so um, you know empathic towards parents in this situation. Or, or any other, any family member, but you know, as a as a yeah, sure. as, a, as a parent, I think that's usually the worry over a, a child is usually the most intense of all the relationships, right? Yeah. So, um, so maybe like, yeah. As a last uh, as a last note, like, how do you think this has affected you as a psychiatrist in your in your practice and your your perspective? And um, yeah, um, yeah. Well, you know, I I think I, I I you know your question sort of makes me think of Louis Pasteur's um, uh, uh, quip, uh, you know, that chance favors the prepared mind, and I think that you know having evolutionary principles, uh, I think opens my mind to different solutions and different uh, um, you know uh, different uh, entertain different etiologies to the things and and I think it just broadens my perspective and uh, um, I, I think that now here's an interesting thing because a lot of times and I, I I've heard this question asked to a lot of uh, psychiatrists I like, like Alfonso Troyos Troyosi and and Martin Brune and and guys who are both researchers and clinicians and one thing that you know it, 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 that that sort of comes to me is that that the quality of the therapist is is only a small function of whether therapy is successful. That actually most of the uh, most of the, um, the the function is on patient demographics. So you know we sort of toot our own horn as therapists, but it's actually picking the right patients that gives you the greatest success in treatment. Uh, so so 
uh, you know, it, it's because uh, I think they've, they've, they've some, done some studies and, and some have even shown that only 10 percent of the variance is related to, to the, the quality of the, of the therapist. And that 90 percent is about is, is patient characteristics, whether whether, you know, things like CBT will be successful or not. So mm-hmm. so what I'm trying to say is that it is really hard to measure if if my evolutionary perspective helps patients because okay. I'm already I'm already dealing with a really low variance, right? Okay, so, okay. interesting. So you know, it's you know, and 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 so so that you know, so there's that. But I mean, I, I think there's. I'll give you one example of think where evolutionary, uh, uh, where, where evolution has helped me. Um, I I have a hypothesis, for example, it's just a clinical hypothesis that that there's five types of depression. And, uh, you know, that's based on my conversation with, 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 you know, with John Price in the past and, and you know, just evolutionary thinking. Um, and, and now I'll just share those. I think that almost every case of depression can be uh, traced back to either, you know, uh, genetics, which is like bipolar disorder. So being just having like really high genetic loading for mood uh, dysregulation. Um, organic, so like low thyroid, things like that, or, or, or you know, drinking alcohol, which is a depressant. That's number two. Number three is um, uh, uh, um, childhood trauma, uh, which can make you exquisitely sensitive to to dysphoria and anxiety. And then the last two are, and this is where I get from John Price, is, is uh, um, a, a reduction, a, a diminishment in your social status and or a breaking of an intimate relationship. And what's really interesting, a lot of that sort of idea is based on, you know, thinking in evolutionary terms. And, you know, it doesn't fail me very often. I mean, when I see patients with depression, and you know, and I think, you know, it's not finding the cause often is irrelevant. You know, sometimes you just put somebody on a medication and that's all that's needed. And, and knowing what the cause was doesn't help you. But sometimes knowing the, the roots of your depression does help the patient. Um, and, you know, with this model, I almost like, you know, I almost always find the ideology. I'm usually not too sort of sitting there dumbfounded by why this person has become depressed. Mm. Okay. Nice. Interesting. Um, great. That's, uh, yeah, that's a very, very interesting interview, Joe. And I would, I would recommend everyone to check out your book. Um, if they're interested in the shamanism hypothesis, it's, uh, really has you know so many great examples and it's got kind of a to b to z on uh, everything you need to know so so yeah thank, thank you for that is there anything uh anything last that you'd like want to share any anything that we haven't covered that you thought any is relevant well or, I, uh, I would just like to say that i think your your research in in sort of this neurodiversity and specialized minds and uh in and your focus on um uh, ne- uh negative frequency dependent uh um uh, uh uh, you know, selection. Yeah, yeah. Selection. Thank you. Um, uh, and and we talked about this uh, before, and uh, I think that's really um, just you know uh, really uh, work that's I think is uh, at the vanguard of this uh, of, uh, of evolutionary psychiatry. If I was a younger man, I think I would be <laughs> doing almost the exact same things you are doing. I think you have great scientific intuition, um, and. Oh. These are, the, these are the questions I think that are uh, I think you're I think you're 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 you know you're, you're really hitting on the on the on the right buttons. Um, so yeah, well, I, I don't thank I don't you. Want to, I don't want to be too funny. Well, that's, I wasn't expecting that as a final comment, but I'll, I'll take it. Yeah, sure. And actually, I am. You know, <laughs> you know, my wife always says, if you know, try to you know try to be nice. And so this is this is <laughs> easy because because I don't have to lie. <laughs> ah, well, that's 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 uh, that's very nice of you to say. And actually, I am doing an episode on that paper and on on the kind of negative frequency dependency. We didn't really go into that because maybe as a last comment, I will say that yeah. you, you in your book you um you concentrate a lot on group selection um yeah. and how having a shaman in the group would be a, a beneficial thing because it helps people collaborate and uh, yeah. and also helps them kind of against um, outsiders and it kind of yes. is this kind of mesh, right? It's this kind of social mesh. Um, and you kind of frame that in this group selection perspective, but uh, but yeah, some of the stuff I've been working on is that um, is looking, as you say, at negative frequency dependency and how we can like integrate this this kind of group scale thinking. Which I think you're right. There's probably this 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 range of experiences which shamanism are clearly acting to kind of keep the group together. But you also need this like individual selection. Like why they can't be sacrificing themselves completely. 
Um, there has to be some sort of process which kind of keeps these genes in the population and then allows individuals to succeed themselves. And so that's something that I'm kind of, yeah, working on uh, yeah, yeah, and, a bit. And, and you know, and uh, uh, I mean, this, the, the book was written, you know, well, I, I mean, it was written actually probably you now it's almost been 15 years now with it, you know, with the ideas and everything like that. And uh, I think, you know, um, look, uh, when we look at a, a task specialist, and you know, and you know this area be much better than I do, but but you know, uh, what what are the possible uh, mechanisms for it? Well, negative frequency uh, dependent selection, uh, heterozygous advantage, antagonistic pleo pleopatry, uh, um, and group selection. Okay, um, I I do believe that group selection is a factor. I I've never, uh, you know, uh, said that it's the whole. Thing story or, you know, I don't think it's like none of the story. I think it's part of the story. Uh, I actually, you know, with your research uh, uh, that you're starting to focus more on negative frequency dependent selection, I've been convinced. I think that was a uh, area that I underestimated. And I think it's, a, I, I would put that up at being a much bigger factor. And I think, again, sometimes you need, you need some, you, you may need the negative frequency dependent selection to get your foot in the door. And then, all of a sudden, you have a successful task specialization, and then group selection becomes, you know, very powerful. Right. You know, yeah, this but, is, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so, the, you know, it, it, they, these things I think sometimes work sort of hand in hand, and they have symbiotic yeah. relationships. So, so I don't see these as opposing ideas. It, you know, I see these as complementary ideas, and I, you know, really like to be wrong. Um, I guess not publicly, but. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I mean, um, I mean, for example, I, I didn't write the book till ten years later because I actually I would take I would take papers and I would after I wrote the initial arg when I wrote the initial paper it was just uh, it was just um, uh, it was just a hypothesis I actually believed in my heart that it was probably not going to be true but it just sort of felt compelling I I also hadn't broken you know the chains of of sort of the constraints of where I my teachings that that schizophrenia was a was had to be a disease and I remember for about ten years I would get papers that were related to you know either you know the genetics of schizophrenia things like that and I just I just put them in a pile and I remember going to them and reading them over like a weekend and, you know, and going, oh my gosh, I mean, all the, all the papers that are coming out are showing that, you know, the hypothesis, you know, all the predictions of the hypothesis seem to be going in that direction. And that emboldened me to write the book. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then, uh, and yeah. And to follow up on what you've been talking about, uh, the, the multiple levels of selection or multi-level selection as it, as it's called, totally like what, what you can have is negative frequency dependency, which, which just for anyone's Who's, who kind of doesn't know the terminology. The basic idea is that um, rare traits can be very valuable and the more common that something becomes, the less valuable it becomes. And this is actually why sex ratios are kind of maintained at about 50-50 because as soon as you have more males than uh, females, it becomes better to be female. And then, and, you could, and, and this is kind of a very, uh, almost a universal principle that like there's these little niches that you can fit into. The more people who are being shamans, plausibly, like the less useful it becomes to be a shaman, right? Um, or, you know, yeah, so so I think it, it does fit um, quite nicely. But then, yeah, once you have this society that has division of labor and there's, you know, a more effective religious context, then the, maybe the group interactions can become much more important. Like they'll, one group who has a very effective shaman will survive a famine more effectively. Um, they'll be able to outcompete in war, uh, like against the groups who don't have that kind of shaman. So that's what you can kind of talk about in terms of multi-level selection is yeah how groups function in kind of out competing other groups and then replicating the individuals and the groups the kind of the group structure itself um, but then also at the same time you, yeah often the models require some sort of force to kind of make sure that there's only a few people who have psychosis or whatever it is or autism or something like that yeah and I'm, I'll be doing a podcast episode on that myself actually uh, in, a, in I think the next episode to this one being released so um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thanks a lot, Joe. Um, it's been great hey, talking to you. Thank you. It was, really, it was a really wonderful conversation. <laughs>